Hello, and thank you for joining me today for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series, and this as a bit of a follow-up session. So many of you joined me for the previous webinar as part of this series where I talked about avoiding a mess in Adobe Lightroom Classic. And as always, we try to take as many questions as possible during the webinar presentations and there were quite a few, many photographers I know getting overwhelmed with challenges in Lightroom Classic, creating a, having created a little bit of a mess. Now, I know some of you are trying to make sure that you avoid a mess in the first place, which is wonderful. And others, of course, have gotten to have a bit of a mess. So today we're going to have a little Q&A session where I'll address the questions that we weren't able to get to in the previous webinar presentation. And of course, you're welcome to submit questions here today as well. More on that in just a moment. This, by the way, is actually a very similar format to a new offering that we have, which is Gray Learning Office Hours. That is open only to Gray Learning Ultimate Bundle subscribers. And so if you like this Q&A type of approach where you're able to, number one, pose your own questions, but also, number two, to learn from the questions that are posed by other photographers that may be of interest to you. So if you're already a Gray Learning Ultimate Bundle subscriber, then you'll get a periodic reminder about those sessions. We have one scheduled for early July, for example. And if you're not a subscriber, that might be a good reason, an additional reason that you might want to consider joining me. I am Tim Gray, so thank you very much once again for joining me. And I do want to mention a thanks to Tamron, who sponsors the Gray Learning webinar series. So thank you, Tamron, for making this possible. And if you enjoyed this presentation, I'll bet you'll find some videos, some other presentations that you'll enjoy as well on the Tamron YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com slash tamronvids. Before we jump into the questions, I also want to make sure that if you have a mess in Lightroom Classic, I can help. There's a variety of options, actually. Last week I mentioned the one-on-one -on -one offering that we have, but another great option is the Cleaning Up Your Mess in Lightroom course that I have created. This is easily my most popular course. I know a lot of photographers struggle with Lightroom Classic and have a mess there, and so you can get a discount on this course. So as part of this webinar presentation, we're offering half price on the Cleaning Up Your Mess in Lightroom Classic course. You can use this link here, timgray.me slash mess50 to get to that page with the discount included automatically. And then I do want to mention also, for those of you that have questions of your own, in addition to learning from the questions that are being posed by others, in your control panel for the GoToWebinar platform that we're using for this presentation, you will find a questions field. And so you can type your questions there and I will get to as many of those as I possibly can. All right, and so the first question actually that I want to address, there was a question related to font size, which isn't exactly directly related to Lightroom cleanup, but I know this is an issue many photographers face, myself included, is the font size being a bit small in Lightroom. That's something that you can change in preferences on interface. I'll show that to you in just a moment. But the font doesn't change very much. And so if you take a look at this font, for example, this obviously is a screen capture from within Lightroom. If you switch to the large font option, I'm going to change to that version and you'll see it doesn't change very much. The biggest factor really is in terms of the overall resolution for your display. So here, for example, you see that I'm running Lightroom Classic and the font appears a bit larger than what you saw in those previous screen captures. And that's because for purposes of this webinar presentation, I'm running my display at a very low resolution so that all the details show up a little bit better. And that means the text is a little bit easier to read. So if we go up to the menu bar within Lightroom, and in the case of Macintosh, we go to the Lightroom Classic menu on Windows, you'd go to Edit on the menu and choose Preferences. Under Interface, you can choose Small, which is the default, versus Large. You do then need to restart Lightroom in order to see that change. But again, it's not much of a change, and so you may be better off lowering your screen resolution. That's not the perfect solution because, of course, then if you're working at a lower resolution, you're going to see 
your images appearing much larger and filling up more of the available space, which means that you're not able to see, for example, as many thumbnails at one time. All right, so yeah, Richard, I did want to address that because I know that's one of the things I wish Adobe would give us more flexibility there one day, hopefully, maybe they will. I should also mention that with a particularly high resolution display, such as a 4K monitor or a retina display, if you're an Apple user, for example, that is a particular problem because the resolution is generally quite high. All right, so there was some talk in the past about, in the, our previous session, about keywords and searching for photos, and I encourage you to get familiar with the various options for finding your photos because then you're actually able to, of course, locate a particular image. And also by being familiar with those options, you'll get a better sense of what attributes you might want to use within the context of the metadata for your photos. And so a couple of questions that relate to keywords and metadata in general. So Edie was asking about when to use captions versus keywords. And so here, if we take a look at an image, now this of course is just a test catalog. So there may be some random data here, not necessarily every image is keyworded, for example. But here we take a look at this photo and we have Austria and stream and water as some keywords that have been assigned to this image. And we can also, down in the metadata section, we can find a caption field. And so Edie's question was, when would you use one versus the other? I encouraged the use of keywords as a tool for being able to better locate your photos, to remind yourself of what the contents of the photo are. But what about captions? Well, ultimately, both captions and keywords are part of a metadata standard so that, for example, the XMP option, which I will address a question on a little bit later, for saving metadata out to the actual image files. This enables you to use standard metadata to remind yourself of particular attributes of a photo or to search for a particular keyword, for example. And so a handful of related questions here. Number one is when would you use captions versus keywords? Well, in general, I would say use keywords as your primary tool for using shall we say, words in metadata to organize your photos, to identify the subject matter, to identify maybe the mood of a photo. Basically, anything that you might want to search for in order to locate a particular photo or be reminded of for that particular photo. So maybe I would add, for example, the name of this stream in Austria. If I knew the name of it, I could add that as a keyword. The caption in general, I don't think of as being a replacement in any way for keywords. Generally speaking, the title and caption fields are fields that I would use for a step beyond that keyword approach to organizing your photos. And that would be helpful for things such as submitting images to stock photography agencies, or of course, submitting, uh, sharing your photos in other ways. So for example, when you share your photos, publish your photos directly to Facebook from inside Lightroom Classic, you can use the title and the caption as the title and caption respectively, so that instead of having the title being just the file name, it could be a title that you've typed into metadata. And then Joan asked if it was possible then to search, to locate images based on photo captions. And so, for example, I'll just put the word boulder into the caption field, just because this image contains a boulder. And then if I go and search, if I go to the grid view, then I'll typically have the library filter visible up at the top of the grid view display. You can also press the backslash key on the keyboard when you're in the library module in order to display that library filter. And among the options on the library filter bar is a text option. I can search specifically for keywords, but I can also search for the caption specifically, for a title specifically, or any searchable field, which does not include every field, but the, key, the fields that Adobe has defined as being searchable. Of course, that list is not listed here inside of Lightroom Classic, but it's the key options. And so if I search for the word Boulder, for example, you'll see that the image with Boulder in the caption does get located. So yes, Joan, you can indeed search based on those captions. So if you decide to put those to use as an additional sort of, I would think of that almost as an above and beyond tool for organizing your images, then you can 
uh, obviously make use of that in the search facility as well. All right, when it comes to, there were a couple questions that related to folder structure here. And so Tim was asking, no relation, Tim, another Tim was asking, should I use a deep folder structure, meaning folders inside of folders, or a shallow folder structure, which conceptually means that you would have lots of folders. My personal preference is to use a relatively shallow folder structure. And so you'll see here in my little sample setup of folders that for the most part, most of my folders are what you might think of as top level folders, meaning they're directly on the hard drive or directly in the particular location where I'm storing my photos. So that might be another folder like the pictures folder on your internal hard drive. But for many of us that translates into using an external hard drive that is exclusively used for photos. And so the top level folders on that hard drive would be your primary organizational tool. And for me personally, I think that a relatively shallow structure works best in that you've organized your photos in a relatively straightforward and simple way based on the way you think about your photos, as I talked about in the previous session. And so for me, that primarily means location because most of my photography involves travel on some level at least. And so typically, the name of my folder starts off with the name of the location. So when I visit the Palouse region of Eastern Washington State, for example, that folder would be called Palouse and maybe with the year so that I can differentiate between various trips. And then I'll only create a parent folder when I have multiple folders. And so let's actually do that just so you get a better sense of how that's done. So let's say in this case, I only have a few of my Palouse folders here. In actual fact, I've visited the Palouse every year for the last 10 years. And so I have 10 or 11 folders, I think it is at this point, for those different trips to the Palouse. And so if I had all of those here, certainly I'd start to think, I have a lot of Palouse folders. There's a lot of redundancy there. The list is getting long. Why don't I essentially collapse that structure? As you can see for this Italy section, for example, I can collapse the Italy parent folder so that I have a more streamlined view. So that gives you a little bit of a balance, the best of both worlds, you might say, where it's a relatively flat or shallow folder structure so that you don't have a very complicated structure. It doesn't get increasingly challenging to find the right folder, but you still are taking advantage of parent and child folders as appropriate. So up at the top of the list of folders, to the right of the folders heading, you'll see an option, the plus symbol where we can click and either add a folder or add a subfolder. So a subfolder means put a folder inside the current folder. That's not an option you're probably going to use all that often. Every now and then you might make a subfolder so that you can take a subset of photos and put them into a folder inside of the parent folder. Typically it's gonna be adding a brand new folder altogether as would be the case here. So I'll choose add folder and then I can navigate out to my external hard drive in this case that contains those photos. And then I'll create a new folder on that drive and I'll just call this Palouse for example. Create that folder and click choose down at the bottom right. And now I have that Palouse folder available on my hard drive. And you'll see that it's listed here. It is now an available folder. So I could drag and drop pictures into this folder, for example. You note that it has zero images thus far in that folder. But I could, for example, drag and drop either photos or other folders. So I'll drag and drop this Palouse 2015 folder. I get a confirmation dialog. I'll go ahead and click move because yes, indeed, these folders and photos are actually being moved out on my hard drive. And that's one of the key things that I think it is important to keep in mind is that in Lightroom Classic, the folders list by its design, by its nature, is reflecting your hard drive storage. And that's one of the reasons, as a reminder, it is so critically important not to make any changes to files or folder structure outside of Lightroom. It has to be done inside of Lightroom. Note, by the way, we can move multiple folders. So I can click on one folder and then hold the shift key and click on another folder to select a range. So first and last, click on the first folder, hold the shift key and click on the last folder. You can also hold control or command 
to toggle the selection of individual folders as you click on them, and then I can move those additional Palouse folders. Now you'll notice once again that Italy folder structure for the 2018 trip. I had divided the photos up into additional subfolders. In actual fact, this is not something that I typically do. I was simply demonstrating the concept, but normally I would not divide a single trip into multiple folders. Instead, I would use, for example, keywords to further organize those images. And note, by the way, if you do start getting carried away with your folder structure, or if you have lots and lots of folders, thankfully, Adobe, not too long ago, added a filter option, a search option, so that I could, for example, enter a search term and have only the folders that match that search term actually appear on the list there. So that makes it a lot easier to manage your folder structure in the context of Lightroom. And that carries us nicely into Lisa's question about a date-based folder structure. If you have a date-based folder structure, how do you change it to, as she calls it, a keyword structure? And again, the idea is that if we're going to be scrolling through our folders looking for an image, and maybe we don't remember which folder an image was in, so we're hoping to jog our memory by scrolling through that list, it's helpful if the folder names are meaningful. And so for me, again, that means location typically. I gave the example previously of a wedding photographer. They would use the client's name. A commercial photographer would probably use the client's name as well. Whatever's most meaningful. And for some photographers, I know I have talk to them. I believe that they are being honest, that they can organize by date. I am definitely not one of those people, and so I do not use a date-based folder structure. But if you did, the process is actually relatively straightforward. And so I don't actually have a date-based structure here. At least I don't believe so. Let's double check. No, I don't have any date-based folders here in this sample, but we can just pretend if you don't mind. So we will pretend that the Capri folder and the Rome folder and the Sardinia folder, that those represent multiple dates from the same trip and we want to consolidate. In this case, we might consolidate into the parent folder there, but let's just pretend a more typical scenario that we just want to consolidate these multiple date-based folders, even though they're not at the moment, into a single folder. Very simple. Number one, we're always doing this inside of Lightroom, not out in the operating system. And first we would decide which folder is going to be the key folder, the actual folder. So let's say Capri is going to be the folder that we're going to keep, and we're going to merge Rome and Sardinia into those folders. We simply go to each of those folders in turn, or, well, I won't get too complicated. We could actually select multiple folders and then select all of the images in those folders. But let's keep it a little bit more simple at the moment. I can go into that folder and press Control A on Windows or Command A on Macintosh to select all of the images in that folder and then drag and drop to the desired location. So I'll confirm with that Move command. I'll go to the Rome folder now and do the same thing. Just select all with Control A or Command A on the keyboard, drag and drop to the desired destination folder. Now, or almost, there we are. We have these two empty folders. In this case, I'll select both of them, again, clicking on the first and holding the shift key while clicking on the last, and then right click, and we want to then remove. And in this case, because those folders are empty, they will actually be removed from the hard drive. And so now if we go back to that Capri 2018 folder, then of course, pretending still that this were a date-based folder, so maybe it was, you know, 2018-09-23 or you know whatever the numbers might be for those date-based folders, then we could simply right-click and rename. And so in this case, we might just call this Italy 2018, for example, because we've consolidated multiple dates from one trip into a single trip. Of course, that matches the name of the parent folder, but we won't worry about that too much. In fact, I'll just rename this uh, we'll call this B, as in the other one. I can then put that into the appropriate parent folder, moving again as appropriate in this case, and then the empty 2018 folder. Now, obviously, I could have consolidated into this folder in the first place, but I think more importantly, 
is to realize that what I've been doing here, I'm gonna rename to get rid of that B, what I've been doing here is basically just creating folders, moving photos, consolidating them into another folder, maybe moving one folder into another folder, etc. All of those things that you might be familiar with doing out on the actual operating system, within the operating system, you can do inside of Lightroom Classic. And so when you don't like your existing folder structure, then by all means, you can redefine that folder structure, move photos around, split fo photos into two different folders if need be, if that makes more sense to you, consolidate from multiple folders into one, adjust that overall folder structure, etc. All right, Michael's asking, uh, as far as he knows, you cannot synchronize smart collections. <laughs> and he puts parenthetically, come on Adobe, people have been asking for this for more than six years. Yes, I would agree. Is there any workaround that you can recommend? Unfortunately, you're right. You're not able to synchronize to the Adobe Creative Cloud for smart collections. A smart collection is a, essentially a saved search criteria. So here, for example, favorites with water, and that would, I'm sure, be defined as with a star rating and with keyword water, for example, or Instagram photos. I mentioned in the previous session, I use quote unquote fake keywords. Instagram share, for example, is a keyword that I use to identify photos that I have shared to Instagram. And so I can use that as a smart collection criteria so that I can see very easily. And so if I add a keyword, in this case, Instagram share, for example, to the image, that image will automatically get added to the smart collection. So why can we not synchronize smart collections to the clouds? You'll notice I have this Austria stream collection, for example, over to the left side. You see that little, it's sort of like a lightning bolt symbol, a double headed arrow type of an icon. That means that this folder has synchronization enabled. So these images are being, or have been synchronized to the Adobe Creative Cloud, to Adobe servers, and so now they're available from virtually anywhere. So I could view them on my smartphone with Lightroom Mobile. I could go point my web browser to lightroom.adobe.com and sign in with my creative ac account and see those these images there. However, I cannot enable synchronization. You'll notice there's a checkbox to the left, an empty checkbox to the left of my other normal collections, but for the smart collections, it's not the case. The only workaround, unfortunately, would be to take those images and add them to a normal collection that you also then enable synchronization for. Essentially, the reason I suppose that it's not yet been enabled for smart collections is that now you've got to constantly keep track of which images meet certain criteria and update the synchronization. I know that Adobe has very smart software engineers who could absolutely make that happen. And so hopefully at some point they will listen to those of us who have asked for that feature and actually add that. Terry asks a great question, a common question. I made reference to the option to save metadata automatically to the XMP sidecar files is the way we typically talk about this. So I'm gonna go up to the catalog settings command. So from the Lightroom Classic menu for Macintosh users, from the edit menu for Windows users, choose catalog settings, and then go to the metadata tab. And the key option here is to automatically write changes into XMP. As I mentioned, what that really means is to save metadata out to the actual image files themselves. And so that means that for a JPEG or a TIFF image, for example, that the metadata, let's say you add a keyword or a star rating, for example, that the metadata will be saved to the actual images out on the hard drive. In the case of proprietary raw captures, that means that we will not actually write directly to the image file itself, the, the raw capture essentially, but rather we'll be saving that information to an XMP sidecar file. And that is the reason for the setting having this reference to XMP. For raw captures, proprietary raw captures, the data gets saved into XMP. Keep in mind, this is only 
for standard metadata. So things like collections, pick and reject flags, features that are specific to Lightroom, virtual copies, for example, that information is not saved to XMP. And so Terry's asking, can you save metadata to XMP retroactively? And this would apply not just to raw captures, but to the, uh, for example, JPEG images as well. This actually is a retroactive setting. If you turn this on, then Lightroom will go out and actually update all of the images on your hard drive automatically in the background. The caveat is that it doesn't actually tell you that it's doing that. And so you don't really know for sure. You don't have that confidence of knowing when that process is completed. If you would like that confidence, there's essentially a, a workaround. If we go to all photographs, so in the catalog section of the left panel in the library module, you can go to all photographs and then make sure that the filter is set to none so that you're not actually filtering. In other words, so that you're actually seeing all of your images. And then you can select all, so Control A on the keyboard for Windows users, Command A for Macintosh users. And then if you go up to the menu, you'll find an option on the metadata menu for save metadata to files. The keyboard shortcut, by the way, is Control S on Windows, Command S on Macintosh. When you choose that command, you'll see, first of all, a confirmation dialog. I'll go ahead and click continue. But up at the top left on the identity plate now, you'll see a saving metadata status indicator here. So once that process is finished, then of course, you'll have that confidence of knowing that up to that point, all the metadata, all the supported metadata, I should clarify, has been written. So keywords and star ratings and all the standard metadata fields will have been saved out to the images. Again, XMP sidecar file for raw captures and for other file types, the actual file itself, the, the source image, you might say. All right, let's see here. Uh, so Audrey's question, she says, if you accidentally deleted a folder and then backed up, wouldn't the backup also delete the folder? And so this would relate to my suggestion, number one, to back up your photos and your catalog. And specifically, I use a software application called GoodSync to back up my photos, for example, among my other data. And what that does is make an exact copy. There's an option in GoodSync. As long as you have enough hard drive space available, you can have it hold on to deleted files for a period of time. The default is 30 days. Normally, yes, if you delete a folder, then you use a synchronization backup. Since the whole point is to mirror your disk to make the backup look like an exact copy of the original, then yes, if you accidentally delete a folder, then you back up, you're deleting on the backup copy as well, creating a bigger problem for yourself. Of course, hopefully you catch that problem before you perform that synchronization backup, but you can also take advantage, as I mentioned, of that option to preserve anything that was deleted in the context of those photos and folders, in the context of that backup, preserve those deleted options for a period of, again, by default, 30 days. Uh, David's asking if you can apply more than one import preset during import. No, unfortunately. When we import photos, then we're able to apply a preset, a developed preset, to the images, but it's only one. So if you had a couple of additive presets, so if I click the import button down at the bottom of the dialog here. Oops, I have a dialog here on the other screen. So I'll go ahead and clear those out so I can bring up that import dialog and we have the on the right panel the develop settings and so we can choose to apply you know maybe you want black and white preset or what have you I have some import presets that I assign but you can only apply a single preset in that context I imagine that that question may have partially been motivated by the fact that now when you export photos you can actually export using two different presets. So let's say you're preparing images to share on social media and to post on your blog and you have two different export presets for that purpose, you could actually then have the images exported twice. So you, one for each, you know, that you've selected. So that is a really cool option for exporting, but it's not something that you can do upon import in terms of assigning 
And of course, in some cases, those two presets would conflict with each other because they might contain some of the same overall settings, some of the same adjustments with different settings. Uh, Judith asks, if there's an advantage of using folders if one is assigning keywords to an image. Yes, and this sort of gets at Lightroom, the cloud-based version, as opposed to Lightroom Classic, what I refer to as the desktop version, even though they both work on the desktop. But the advantage to using folders, uh, number one is that you can use folders to your advantage in terms of an overall organizational workflow. And so if you ask me for a photo of a crop duster, I'm gonna go looking in my Palouse folders. Obviously, I could search for the keyword crop duster. Well, number one, that requires that I do a pretty good job of assigning keywords to my images. So if you keyword with great detail, if you're very diligent about keywording, then folders may be of limited benefit. That said, I still recommend using the folder structure, even if you think you don't need it, in part, because that folder structure exists out on your hard drive and that gives you a base level organization even in the absence of Lightroom and even in the absence of your metadata. So again, a lot of this depends on your particular workflow and your particular needs, but my feeling is I'd like to have that extra layer of organization, that very basic level of organization. I can still search. One of the things that is great about Lightroom Classic is that we can search across all photographs. So I can say, show me every single picture that has a one star or greater rating, or show me every picture that has a particular keyword assigned to it. But I can also very easily then navigate to folders. So if I'm looking for a photo of a particular subject and I know that I captured it in Italy, in other words, I don't wanna see every photo that contains that subject, I want to go to a particular photo trip. So it just gives me an additional layer of question, of uh, an additional layer of organization when I'm searching for, you know, sort of different questions I can answer for myself essentially. And so, you know, giving me more flexibility and again, giving me that opportunity to maintain an organizational structure out on my hard drive itself. Uh, I'd mentioned the XMP option. Kathleen's asking, can data actually be written to RAW rather than XMP? In concept, yes. And there are some software tools that will allow you to do some of that. But in general, no. In general, the software, for example, Lightroom, does not enable you to write out to the actual RAW capture with the exception of date and time changes. And so just briefly here, revisiting the dialog for catalog settings, you'll notice once again, the automatically write changes into XMP. If you have that checkbox turned on, which is a prerequisite, and you then turn on the write date or time changes into proprietary raw files, that can be written, that can be changed, the capture time directly in the raw file itself. Generally, it's best not to, but in some cases, so for me, if I forgot to change the time on my camera, for example, I'd like to be able to actually update the file, the capture time directly in the file. But there's a certain risk that the raw capture will be corrupted based on those changes. And so that's why most software does not enable you to write changes, to write metadata updates out to the XMP files. All right, just looking at some of the other questions that have been posted here. Uh, oh, Gina, real good question, a quick one. Catalina, the op upgrade to the Mac operating system, Macintosh operating system, Catalina, any remaining issues? I would say at this point, the real answer there is that as far as I'm concerned, perfectly safe time to upgrade now. I'm sure I've mentioned in the past that when I first upgraded to Catalina, a wild variety of problems. Now those have mostly been resolved or won't be resolved, meaning the backward compatibility issue of certain software does not support the operating system. At this point, it's not likely to be updated at all. All right. And John's asking about uh, getting collections synced online to have the metadata. Yes, that metadata will be there. So for example, if you synchronize a set of photos 
to the Creative Cloud from Lightroom Classic and then browse those photos on your smartphone, for example, with the Lightroom mobile app or in the web browser by visiting lightroom.adobe.com, then you will have access to that same metadata. There's some limitations in terms of what's actually displayed, but conceptually the information is there. And so Frank's asking, there's so a handful of questions. So there's been some questions about Good Sync. I should mention, by the way, we do have a course that covers Good Sync, that covers my workflow for backing up with Good Sync. So you might be interested in taking a look at that on the Gray Learning website. But Frank's asking not about the Good Sync backup, which would be for your photos and other data, but the actual backup of the Lightroom catalog. And so when it comes to the catalog backup, he's asking, you know, when it exits, it creates a backup. Is this the main backup of the catalog or a secondary backup? Well, the backup will be as many copies of the backup as you allow. So each time you exit Lightroom and it offers to create a backup for you, it's creating by default in the same folder where the Lightroom catalog is stored, a backups folder will be created or will already be there as the case may be and a new backup will be created each and every time. Now, of course, as I mentioned previously, I strongly recommend backing up your Lightroom catalog in part because during that backup process, you're able to take advantage of the option to check for errors essentially and to optimize the catalog. But that also means that you may end up with multiple backups. And so, for example, this obviously once again is just a sample set up on my hard drive here. This is just a sample catalog that I use. You can see the catalog itself and inside of the folder that contains the catalog, there's also a backups folder. Now, since this is just a demo catalog, I do not back it up on a regular basis because it's just not a critical catalog for me. But you can see there's a backup from 2018, another from 2020. Conceptually, if you're backing up once a week, of course, at the end of the year, you've got 52 backups here. They are compressed, but still not tiny. I mean, in this case, the catalog itself is not that big, so it's this 17 megabytes. I, my actual catalog is over 100 megabytes, and so not necessarily a tiny file, but they do consume some space that you might not need to use up because you don't need all these old backups. So anything more than a few months old is probably not going to be all that useful. And so I periodically just go in here and delete some of these folders in the backups folder. And I should hasten to add that generally I would not want to back up my catalog in the same folder as the catalog. In this case, it's a test catalog. If like me, you're using something like Time Machine to back up your computer's hard drive, then of course, you're also getting that additional copy of the backups. But I would recommend, for example, if you have your catalog on the internal hard drive and your photos on an external hard drive, when Lightroom exits, it gives you the option to choose where you want the backup to go. You can send the backup off to the external hard drive rather than the internal hard drive. But yes, it is an additional copy of your overall catalog. All right, uh, so Bob asks, what hierarchy do you use for keywords? I don't use a hierarchical keyword structure. In concept, it works great. It can be a helpful tool for streamlining your keywording workflow. The problem is that hierarchical keywords aren't truly supported by any metadata standards, meaning they're supported, but in ways that software uses tricks to support. So for example, having keywords would normally, for example, maybe be separated by commas. They might use a slash or a pipe symbol to indicate that this is a hierarchical relationship. And it can just get really messy really quickly because different software supports hierarchies in different ways. And so I tend to just use a flat keywording structure. Oh yeah, Philip is asking about uh, what he re refers to as fuzzy dates. So if you've scanned slides and you only know the month and year. So in that type of a scenario, I would still try to organize with your existing structure. But also keep in mind, you know, I talk about that I use a folder structure based on trips 
and I don't use a date-based structure, but you may find that you use sort of catch-all uh, folder structure for something. So the key is that you can mix and match a folder structure. So for example, I will use a location-based folder structure, but then I might periodically just have like personal snapshots, just random photos that don't really relate to anything that I've captured with my smartphone, for example, and so I can kind of mix and match. And so in the context of not knowing the dates, even if you're using a date-based folder structure, you could estimate to the best of your ability and give some indications. So for example, give an estimated year and just put circa after the year so that you know that this is a best guess and that you just want to have a folder structure that lines up with that overall date structure. And so for example, I might use you know, scans. In my situation now, my scanned slides they fit into a category all by themselves. So it sort of doesn't matter. Those photos are old. <laughs> They're quite old. And so it doesn't really matter what trip that was or where I captured them or what my intent was. They're just my old slides that I've scanned. And so those could really just go into a single folder called scans and maybe make some subfolders if need be to try and break it up by date. But the reality is I could probably just use a single overall folder for that particular batch of images. So don't hesitate to kind of mix and match a folder structure. Just try to make sure that it stands out a little bit. And so, for example, you might notice here, I have some folders. Now these were for online workshops, and so I'm using images for demonstration purposes within this test catalog, but I wanted the folders there to stand out. And so I put an underscore as the first character of the folder name so that the folders would appear at the top of the list rather than somewhere down in the middle based on an alphabetical approach. Uh, Ted is asking here, what would be the best approach if you want to run Lightroom Classic on both a desktop and a laptop computer? And he suggests network slash shared disk. I strongly recommend that you not do that because that can lead to some very serious problems with the catalog. Instead, I would tend to use an external hard drive. So you could keep, for example, if you have all your photos on an external hard drive, you could put the catalog on the external hard drive as well. And that way you have everything in one place. So when you move your hard drive from one computer to the other, the catalog and the photos come along with it. That to me is the best approach in that type of context typically. Now keep in mind, of course, that if you're simply using the laptop to travel with, to capture new photos and you don't need to be able to see everything, all of your existing photos at the same time, then you could use that approach where you have your master catalog at home on your desktop computer and then a traveling catalog on your laptop when you're traveling, import into that catalog. And then of course, when you get home, you can import from your laptop catalog into your desktop catalog using the import from another catalog command. And so very important that merging catalogs. And by the way, in the Cleaning Up Your Mess in Lightroom Classic course, for those of you interested, or if you already have the Gray Learning Ultimate Bundle subscription, you have access to that course. And in that course, I talk about merging catalogs, being able to take multiple catalogs and merge them all together. That same basic workflow would work if you had a traveling catalog that you then need to merge with your master catalog. So depending on the circumstances, either having sort of what you might think of as a bit of a temporary catalog that you use while traveling that you then import into your master catalog or keeping your catalog on an external hard drive along with your photos so that you can just move things all around. Uh, Oliver's asking, how do you rename a drive in Lightroom? And this actually is an important issue if in this example, the previous question there, if you're using an external hard drive, taking it to multiple computers, for example, or even just moving your photos hard drive around to different computers as needed, depending on your particular circumstances, or you've gotten a new drive, whatever the case might be, a new computer. So the answer here depends. So if you're a Windows user, the key is to make sure that the hard drive where your photos are stored always has the exact same drive letter. So on Windows, your internal hard drive is typically going to have the drive letter C, and then your external hard drive can have a different letter, and you can actually assign that hard drive letter within Windows. And if you had multiple computers with an external hard drive that contains your catalog, for example, along with your photos, you could always 
make that the F drive, for example, on all of your computers. For Macintosh users, it's a little bit simpler. The volume label, the name of the hard drive itself, is what Lightroom is using. And so you can see here, for example, that the hard drive that I'm using for my photos is called My Photos. And so if I went out into the operating system, I'd be able to see that the My Photos hard drive is called My Photos, and I could right click and choose to rename to give that drive a different name. So if, for example, I needed to recover from a backup or I bought a brand new hard drive and copied all my photos over to it, all I would have to do is name the new hard drive with the same name as the old hard drive, and Lightroom would be able to find the photos without any difficulty. All righty, let's see here. Uh, Ted's asking about synchronizing the catalogs with Good Sync. Yes, indeed. So if you're, for example, storing your photos on an external hard drive and you use Good Sync to back up the photos drive to the photos backup drive, you could also synchronize, have a different synchronization job to synchronize the backup catalog folder to the backup photos folder, for example. So you can pick and choose. Good Sync does not only require you to identify a hard drive for backing up. In other words, you don't have to only mirror a hard drive to a hard drive. You can also mirror a folder to a folder. So for example, if you had some pictures on your in your pictures folder on your internal hard drive, but most of the photos are stored on an external hard drive, you could still use GoodSync to back up both your photos drive to photos backup and that pictures folder on your internal hard drive also out to the photos backup drive. Uh, Carol was asking about finding old backups, so I covered that in the same folder where your catalog is stored. You'll find that backups folder, and that contains your older catalog backups. And especially if you've got quite a few old ones, then uh, I would say that good idea to just clean those out because they do, you know, it's not a tremendous amount of space typically, but it does add up after a while. Uh, Jerry asks about using XMP. So if he's using this XMP option, can I simply ignore the catalog entirely? Well, no. Well, it depends on how you're using XMP. But So if you're writing XMP from Lightroom, then of course you don't want to ignore the catalog in part because that's where you're doing your work. But I assume you mean really more for purposes of the backup. Keep in mind that when you write metadata out to the XMP sidecar files, only standard metadata fields are backed up. So things like star ratings, and your keywords and your primary metadata, yes. But if you use pick and reject flags, virtual copies, collections, the history in the develop module, those things are not saved to the XMP. The adjustments that you apply in the develop module are. So to me, I don't want to ignore the catalog. I don't want to avoid backing up the catalog, partly because I can take advantage of the error checking and the optimization of the catalog is part of that backup process. However, I do try to minimize my dependency on the Lightroom catalog, which means I try to minimize my use of collections as much as possible. And I only use reject flags as a temporary means of identifying photos that I want to delete just to streamline that workflow. So I try to make sure that what I really care about, and this gets back to that folder option as well, I want a folder structure on my hard drive, and I want all of my standard metadata written out to my hard drive so that if I lost my Lightroom catalog tomorrow, or if Adobe decided they were going to discontinue Lightroom Classic and the only option is cloud-based Lightroom, I would find a different solution for my personal needs, and so I would no longer be making use of my Lightroom catalog, but I would still have the vast majority of that data available. So I try to maximize the value, you might say, of those XMP sidecar files. But of course, I still enjoy having that Lightroom catalog and some of those other features. I make use of collections for synchronization, for example, but I try to make sure that that's not going to be a serious problem should I lose my Lightroom catalog. Hello. All right, let's see here. Ah, so uh, Tim's asking, a. Uh, Great question, which would have been worth me mentioning at the time, but the automatic backup with that XMP sidecar file option. And so just once again, as a reminder, if we 
go into the catalog settings dialog that automatically write changes into XMP. You saw that that took a little bit of time to write that data for my entire catalog in this case, but for a one-off image, this takes virtually no time at all. So the only time you might see a noticeable degradation in performance with that type of scenario is if you've selected a large number of images and updated metadata for a large number of images all at once, and now that metadata needs to be updated for all those photos. But again, that would be a fairly short process, so not something that's going to create, I would say, any significant issues at all. Uh, so Frank says, he, if you check the make an additional backup on import, make an additional copy, the backup did not have the same name as the one imported. And so, the, yeah, the key there, so that if you rename, he mentions that he's using an older version of Lightroom, if you rename the photos during import, the renaming will be reflected, but the folder structure does not match. The folder, when you back up during import, will actually just be called imported on with the date. Uh, Oliver asks, can you save, and I think I sort of mentioned this in passing previously, can you save your Lightroom catalog on a NAS drive, network attached storage drive? No, it's not recommended to use, well, it's technically not supported to use a network attached storage device as the location where you're storing your Lightroom catalog. That can create some issues that lead to problems, corruption issues potentially for the catalog. So strongly recommend attaching via a normal hard drive connection. I know NAS is sort of this somewhere in between. It's a hard drive that's using a network connection. Uh, and in some cases you might be able to essentially trick Lightroom, but it is not supported and it can create problems. And I see, okay, so Terry's asking about that filter header. So a couple of things. I mentioned the library filter that is available here at the top of the grid view. If you're in the loop view display, you can press backslash and that will take you to the library filter in the grid view. Or if I press backslash again, you'll see that toggles library filter on and off. We also can go to the view menu and choose show filter bar. So that backslash is only when you're in the library module. If you are in the develop module, for example, that keyboard shortcut happens to be the before versus after view. So you wanna be in the library module first, and then that backslash key, or again, going up to the menu there. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, so uh, Sean, a little bit of a follow-up question essentially to what I was talking about earlier in terms of date-based folders and clearing them out, consolidating. It doesn't have to be date-based, any folders that you're taking photos. And once you have an empty folder, then you can right-click and remove, and which is the equivalent of deleting without creating any problems whatsoever. And if the folder is in fact empty, the folder will also be removed, deleted from your hard drive as well. All right. Yeah, and so Art's suggesting, you know, is it, does it make sense to organize folders by date versus, for example, activity or, you know, how you think of your photos, whatever you want to consider that, and then organizing using collections so that the folders are by date, but the collections are by activity. That can certainly work. And really, ultimately, you know, I try to emphasize that there's not a single answer that works best for all photographers. And so I am not someone who tells every photographer, you must not use a date-based folder structure or you must use a you know, location-based folder structure as I do, but rather I encourage you to think about how do you think about your photos. In other words, when you're looking for a photo, what comes to mind? And there's a good chance that the folder is going to provide that option for you. Part of the reason that I don't really think that using folders as date-based and then the collections as sort of subject matter, you might say, as that approach, yes, that certainly works. But to me, that's also redundant because if I want to organize by date, then I can go browse all photographs. And on the library filter bar, I can switch to the metadata option where we have a date structure. And so this is just like essentially having a folder structure so I can see 
all of the photos from 2015, for example. Or I can go further and say, I just want to see photos from September of 2015. Or take that a step further and I want to see photos from the 18th of September. Uh, now I've forgotten which year that was. See how bad I am at years? And so I can go through, I can even select a range. So, you know, for uh, this particular week, I want to see the photos. And so we already have the date information in metadata. And so I don't feel that it's necessary to duplicate that with a folder structure. So you absolutely, you could have a date-based folder structure and then use collections to organize your photos based on trips or subject matter or what have you. Just keep in mind that those collections only exist inside your Lightroom catalog. So if you lose your catalog, you're losing those collections. Obviously, if you have a backup catalog, you could recover from that. And yeah, so, and sort of related to that, Kelly says, you know, doesn't keywording make folder structure meaningless? I spend a lot of time doing keywording to eliminate this problem. And I would say, again, not necessarily. If you're looking for a particular subject matter, then yes, of course. But if it's from a particular trip and you don't know the date, it could still be helpful to go to that folder structure. All right. Um, and Lisa's asking a question here, changing the folder structure, do I do that in Lightroom or in my photos? Noting that my photos is the name of the hard drive in this case. And so I suppose you could say that's part and parcel, one and the same. So it's my photos on the, is the name of the external hard drive, but those changes always are made right here inside of Lightroom. And so, for example, I have this, I'll go ahead and clear out the filters here. I have a folder of Capri which obviously is sort of a random floating folder that belongs inside Italy somewhere, but let's ignore that for the moment. If I go out to my external hard drive, so I'll bring up a window for my external hard drive here, you'll see that sure enough, I have that Capri folder. Well, let's just pretend like that's an appropriate folder. In other words, that I don't need to put that into Italy, which is where I would actually put that those photos or that folder. If I go and rename, so if I right click, and choose to rename this folder. And let's just assume this is from 2017, for example. So I'm renaming the folder to Capri 2017. You can see that that gets changed inside of Lightroom. It also gets changed out on my hard drive. Whereas if I rename that folder, let's say I decide that I didn't want the year there, I rename the folder out on my hard drive. When I come back into Lightroom, that folder is now missing. Those photos are missing. Reminding me, critical to always make any of those changes inside of Lightroom, not out on your hard drive. All right, let's see here. Looking at the list of questions, some good questions here. So. Uh, so James was asking, actually, sort of just a structural question here. What's the difference between the arrows on the left margin? So with the folders, you'll see this in the import dialog as well as here inside of Lightroom in the library module, for example. And the same thing would go for collections, for example, collection sets. But you'll notice that we have these triangles to the left, solid versus a dotted triangle. A solid triangle means that there are subfolders. So keep in mind that we can use this spinner control in order to this little triangle to collapse or expand a folder that contains subfolders. If the triangle there is solid, it means there are indeed subfolders that you could expand and go find. If it's that dashed option, it means there are no subfolders there. And so clicking will, well, I was gonna say do nothing. It'll actually just select that folder. So the solid triangle just means that there are indeed subfolders within that location. Uh, so Gene's asking about using two different cameras and in the context of file naming, Lightroom will not allow you to have duplicate file names. And so if you import photos from two different cameras, what would happen is the second batch that have duplicate numbers, those would actually get a parenthetical number. So let's say it was image number one, 
and you've imported the same image number one from two cameras, for the second camera, it will say image number one and then in parentheses one, meaning it's the first copy with the same file name. And so in the context of using multiple cameras, probably a good idea to use file renaming during import just to help distinguish and to make sure that you always have unique numbers. So for example, you might use the camera serial number as part of the file naming structure that you use in that context. And Richards, uh, once again, coming back to that backup during import, you end up with those photos on the backup. It's sort of a redundant backup. So I think of that import, so I'll bring up the import and dialog here. I think of this backup during import. So over on the right hand side, if I'm using the copy option, you'll see that within the import dialog, I can make a second copy too. As I mentioned earlier, that backup is only going to reflect a folder structure with the name imported on and the date, not whatever folder structure you're actually using in your workflow. And so in my mind, that makes it not the most meaningful backup. And so I treat that actually as a temporary backup. The approach that I use is to essentially import, so from my memory card to my external hard drive, I import and during that process I make a second copy to my internal hard drive as a temporary emergency backup, you might say. And then as soon as I have the opportunity, I will use GoodSync, in my case, to back up my photos hard drive where I downloaded those images. I'll back it up to my photos backup drive. And if I'm at all low on hard drive space on my internal hard drive, then I would delete that second copy backup. I don't need to be in any rush to do that because if I have that additional copy on my desktop, that also means now that I have my photos are on my photos drive, they're on my photos backup drive, and I have that import backup on my desktop, then I feel much more comfortable taking that memory card that I downloaded from, putting it into the camera and reformatting it to use again. And so it gives me just a little bit more peace of mind, but whenever I'm low on hard drive space or I just know that I've, for example, come home and backed up to my additional photos backup drive so that I have those three copies at home and in a couple of different locations, of course, then I feel comfortable deleting off the desktop. But it's just, you know, an extra layer of paranoia, essentially, trying to make sure that we are always retaining a backup copy of the photos and essentially as many backup copies as we can to try to make sure that if something goes wrong that we're not actually losing anything so you know if you download photos to your external hard drive and then you erase the media card and then you lose your external hard drive now you have no copies of your photos and so it's a matter of, you know, if what goes wrong, what could go wrong, and trying to make sure that we're addressing, you know, that, that need for always having a backup I can depend upon. And so, yeah, there's a degree of paranoia perhaps involved in that backup workflow, but I'd rather kind of go overboard with my backup and then always have something to fall back on rather than risking that I'm not going to have a backup to actually recover from when something goes wrong. Uh, and I see Nancy, so when I was presenting, I was talking about the map module and wanting to be sure that I was leveraging that information, that metadata, which again is yet more metadata that, than we, that we would want to make sure we're backing up through backing up our catalog and saving metadata out to the photos themselves. Of course, in my case, I'm using a camera with a built-in GPS receiver, and so the photos essentially are being backed up automatically. And so Nancy was asking though, or the, the metadata is being backed up as part of that process automatically. So what do the numbers on the map mean? That's actually how many photos appear in that location. And so these are push pins that identify where I've taken my photos and I can hover over a push pin to see a sample photo. So there are 28 images captured in that location and I can navigate through the images here with these arrow keys. But also then as I zoom in on the map, I'll go ahead and bring up the map as I zoom in here, you'll start to see, well, in this case, not quite as much. 
So let's take a look at a different area of the map where we'll see a better example of what I'm referring to here. As we zoom in, you'll start to see that those pins will spread out, meaning that I've captured photos in a variety of different locations. So once I zoom in close enough, then we should see, unless I, oh, there we go, starting to see a split in locations. So I can see where specifically those photos had been captured on the map. So it just means how many photos in that location, bearing in mind it's not necessarily 100% precise because it'll cluster the images together. And the more you zoom in, of course, the more detailed that information is going to get. So you can see photos captured from the same approximate location on the map there. Uh, Claire asks, is there any way to start totally over with Lightroom but not lose all the editing done to my images? Possibly. Now, that won't be everything. As I've mentioned, when you write metadata out to the actual image files, you are not going to see everything because, for example, collections and virtual copies are not included. And so there's a risk of giving up something if you start over. But if those additional items, pick and reject flags, virtual copies, collections, if those are not critical to your workflow, you could start with a brand new Lightroom catalog, but you'll only have, for example, develop module adjustments, star ratings, keywording, and the other standard metadata fields. You'll only have that information if you had already enabled that option to write the metadata out to the XMP, in other words, to automatically write metadata out to the image files, and that that was done before photos were missing. Because if photos appear as missing in Lightroom, it means Lightroom doesn't know where the actual source image is. And it means, therefore, that you're not going to be able to actually salvage that information. In other words, it was never written out to the actual image file. It, again, assuming that the changes were made after that file went missing, that's going to be missing as well. So that can be a bit tricky. So I know a lot of photographers have made a complete mess of their Lightroom catalog and they just want a clean start. That is possible, but it, you might be losing some key information if you did not save metadata out to the files themselves while that metadata was actually able to be written, meaning while the source images were actually available. All right, so, uh, so Sophie's asking if I recommend using collections. So I use collections on a selective basis, you might say. So I don't like to depend upon using collections because of the fact that they're only available in the Lightroom catalog. And if a collection is critical to me, what I'll actually do is assign a keyword to the photos that I have would otherwise want in a collection. And so... The approach that I would take is, I'll give you a specific example here. I have my Instagram Photos Smart Collection. So instead of using a collection, in this case, I'll use the example of photos that I share to Instagram. This could be for any purpose, for a calendar that I'm producing next year or a book that I'm writing or whatever the case might be. Instead of creating a normal collection for that type of scenario, I would create a smart collection based on a quote-unquote fake keyword. And so in this case, for example, if we take a look at the keywords for these images, these images have Instagram share as a keyword assigned to them. So here I have a variety of keywords in including Instagram share. So the criteria, so when we create a smart collection, we have the option to specify the criteria. So I could say, for example, that I want to create a smart collection where keywords, it's listed under other metadata, where the keyword contains Instagram share, or it contains, you know, water, or whatever the case might be. Uh, in fact, let's see, we have hot air balloon, which maybe is only assigned to a single image in my entire catalog here, I'm not sure, but I can specify that that is my keyword and create that collection, well, I see there's more images than I had realized. So now I have created a smart collection based on a keyword. And that gives me the best of both worlds. I can make use of collections 
in the context of organizing my photos in a variety of ways, but now I've essentially preserved that collection by virtue of the keyword, meaning if I lost my Lightroom catalog, I would still be able to maintain those keywords and I could track down the images for that particular purpose. All right, I know we've already gone a little bit over time here today. Let me see if I can get through a, at least a couple of additional questions here. Uh, so yeah, the question about, uh, so Oliver's asking if you've got a question mark. So for example, I created just such a scenario. If you've got a folder with a question mark, how do you resolve that? Partially, it depends on how we got into this mess in the first place. If it were all of your folders, because as asked earlier, how to change the name of the hard drive, if there was just a mismatch on the hard drive, you could just change the name or the drive letter for the drive and everything magically gets resolved. If it were just a one-off, then you could go back out to the hard drive. So I realize, oops, I changed the name on the hard drive. I shouldn't have. I can go back out to the hard drive and correct that mistake. But I can also right-click on the folder that is missing and choose Find Missing Folder and then navigate out to the applicable location. So in this case, it was the Capri folder. Of course, this requires that I actually am able to identify which folder goes with which missing folder. So depending on how you've gone about that renaming, that can be obviously a little bit tricky. You may need to browse the contents of each folder, look at the previews in Lightroom versus the actual files on your hard drive. But the idea is you can select that missing folder and then that will synchronize everything back up. So if we go back to that Capri folder here, now the name in Lightroom matches the name out on the hard drive. Uh, so David asks, is there any advantage to converting to the DNG, so the Adobe DNG file format on import? Well, any advantage? Sure. The Adobe DNG is openly documented, unlike most proprietary raw capture formats. The files will generally be a little bit smaller, depending on your settings, than the proprietary raw capture with no loss of image quality. One of the reasons I don't want to use DNG personally, well, it's twofold. One, I just don't like the idea of getting rid of the original raw capture that came out of my camera. And two, if you're using that XMP option, then the DNG file is what gets updated. And that means with a synchronization backup, generally speaking, now you're backing up the entire file as opposed to just backing up the tiny little XMP sidecar file. So I don't see any strong reason to convert and I personally prefer not to convert to DNG uh, during import or later. And yeah, clarifying question here, Kathleen asks, double checking, is it okay to have the catalog on the external hard drive rather than the internal drive? Yes, perfectly fine. Is there a speed hit? Yes, your performance will suffer a little bit. So you'll wanna make sure that you're using a fast external hard drive with a fast connection and so that you get good data throughput on that drive because that can be a problem. What I generally recommend to photographers is that they copy that, that catalog to the external hard drive, rename the original folder with something like backup to make it clear that it's now a backup copy, and then to, at that point, test out performance by opening the catalog directly from the external hard drive. And if it's acceptable, wonderful. And it does streamline your workflow in terms of being able to move around amongst computers just by moving that external hard drive. But it does have a tendency to slow down, sometimes significantly. So Carolyn asks, uh, she's a holdout and refusing to pay a monthly subscription fee, still using Lightroom 5.7. Uh, is she making a mistake by not upgrading, missing out on some great updates? I think at this point it is worth having the various features, you know, a handful of features. You'll notice here I can, for example, I assign color labels to photos on import, a red color label to identify photos I've not yet reviewed. I can then also assign a red color label to a folder to say I still haven't finished reviewing all of the photos in that folder or whatever meaning you choose to assign. The star here you can see indicates that this is a favorite folder and I can then filter based on favorite status or color label. I can search, in other words, filter the folders based on text in the folder name. I, these features alone related to folders, I think make it worth having the latest version of Lightroom. Updated support for newer lens profiles as well as raw capture formats 
and a handful of other features as well that I think are well worth spending $10 a month. I know I too am not a fan of everything trying to go subscription, every bit of software and so many other things where they're just trying to get a monthly fee from you rather than trying to convince you to spend your money on an upgrade. I understand those issues. It's a concern for me as well, but $10 a month, I have to say, is a pretty good bargain when it comes to having access to Lightroom Classic, including all the latest features, to Photoshop, to cloud-based synchronization. I personally think it's worthwhile. Uh, keep in mind, you can stop the subscription at any time if you'd like to. If you decide that you're not using Lightroom all that much, you'll still have access to your photos and to your metadata, etc. All right, let's see here. Yeah, and so Sophie's asking if she wants to create a collection of selected images, not all images that include a keyword. Well, then it would be a normal collection, but now you're limited in terms of if you lose your Lightroom catalog, you've lost that collection. And so this approach that I recommended in the context of that Instagram photos keyword, the whole point is you make up a fake keyword that represents only photos that you want in this collection. So sure, I could you know, create an Italy collection and I can drag and drop photos into this collection, but if I lose my Lightroom catalog, if it gets corrupted, I've lost this collection, so I don't know which images were in this collection. If, on the other hand, I make up a fake keyword, the keyword could be, this is not a real keyword, it just means that this image is included in a special collection, and then I copy and paste because I can never type that a second time. I use that as a filtering option for a smart collection. That way the keyword is in the metadata for the photo so you can always revert to that as needed. On Frank, good question. How do you upgrade your catalog? In other words, if you upgrade to a new version of Lightroom that requires an upgrade to the actual catalog format, essentially. Of course, when you reinstall Lightroom, it's usually going to be smart enough to recognize your existing catalog and upgrade it for you. But in the absence of that, if you have another older catalog that you need to work with, for example, simply open the catalog. And so if you go to the file menu and choose open catalog, you can navigate to the folder where that older catalog is and choose to open it. And when you try to open a catalog, if it is created, if it was created with an older version of Lightroom, meaning it doesn't support the current version of Lightroom, then you'll be prompted to upgrade. And it might sound a little scary, but it's perfectly safe because as part of that process, the catalog, it's not going to upgrade per se the existing catalog. It's going to create a new catalog in the new file format. So if something went wrong, you could always revert. And then I think we'll wrap with this. I know there's still many questions here. I'll try to get to as many of these follow-up questions in the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter. And my goodness, maybe we'll need to have another follow-up session if you all have an appetite for hanging out some more and addressing more questions related to Lightroom Classic in terms of cleaning things up. But uh, Judy's asking if she has photos on more than one external hard drive, can Lightroom Classic keep track of those multiple external hard drives? And the answer is yes. In fact, I believe, let me double check. Yes, I do. In this case, I actually have that as the case. I have the My Photos external hard drive and my internal hard drive on this computer. So for example, I have the Instagram folder imported from my internal hard drive, and then I have a wide variety of other folders on an external hard drive. And so for example, if you got to the point where your hard drive is full, and you need to either upgrade, well, let's assume, as is the case for me, I think I mentioned this in the previous session, I use small portable hard drives because I travel so much, and so my capacity is limited on those external hard drives, and so for me, I've needed to go to two external hard drives. Well, that does mean that my folder structure is also then split across two hard drives in this folders list on the left panel within the library module. But yes, absolutely you can work across multiple hard drives as needed. The internal hard drive, for example, the pictures folder, in addition to an external hard drive or multiple external hard drives, as the case may be. All right, I know we've run out of time. Well, we've run over time in this case, but I wanted to try to get to as many of those questions as possible. 
I know there are still some more questions. Again, I'll try to get to as many of those via the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter, or if we're still overflowing with questions, then uh, we'll schedule another Q&A session. But in the meantime, thank you very much. Just a quick reminder that if you're interested in that Cleaning Up Your Mess in Lightroom Classic course, if you're wanting that 50% discount, just be sure to use that timgray.me slash mess50 link to get to that page about that course so you can learn more. And if you use that link, it will include the 50% discount automatically. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you to Tamron for sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series. And I'll hope to see you all again very soon in another online session. Thank you.